wonderful name of Jesus. Welcome to our online broadcast tonight. We are so excited here at Shiloh Tabernacle on behalf of the church ministry and to all of our family and friends that are watching us. We welcome you in the wonderful name of Jesus. For those who are tuning in for the very first time, my name is Pastor Joel Schilling, and we are delighted and we welcome you to our session tonight. Tonight is going to be special as we are going to be having a wonderful speaker with us, and she will be doing a wonderful uh, lesson on the indigenous people here in Alberta. We are delighted and we are excited about what God is going to do. Praise the Lord. Before we get started, let us pray, and we're going to humbly ask the Lord to have his way in this session. I invite you, wherever you might be, to stand and to join us in prayer. Let us pray the prayer of thanksgiving and humbly ask the Lord to have his way in our session tonight. In the name of Jesus, Father, we thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do in this session. I pray that your spirit... I pray, Lord God, that you would come on in in a special way in this session now and to all those that are watching us on the live broadcast. I pray, Father, that they would be touched and that what they're about to learn tonight, God, would be a blessing. And we humbly ask all of this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Everybody say, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Uh, I just wanted to share with you a couple of scriptures before we part for the last little while, especially with the climate of the world, everything that has been going on. Uh, 2020 just seemed to be a year where everything hit the fan. We were dealing with uh, the coronavirus pandemic, and then we were also were dealing with Black Lives Matters, and then we saw some developments here in Canada and uh, recently with the discovery of the residential gra uh, children's graves. And of course, this just sent shockwaves throughout the nation. But to many uh, indigenous people in Canada, they were already aware, they knew of this for a long, long, long time. And I believe the time is now. I believe the time is now for their voice to be heard. We are so thankful that we have precious saints that attend Shiloh Tabernacle from the indigenous community. Praise the Lord. And we value each and every one. And we know that this is the beginning of healing. We know that this is the beginning because you have to go back in order to heal. And so that is exactly what is happening. But to help us as a church, we need to learn about each other. And uh, I know that people in their lives are so busy, and it is not always people's uh, uh, first uh, uh, thing on their list to do, to learn about somebody else's culture. So I, feel, I felt it so important uh, here at Shiloh Tabernacle that we provide an opportunity for all the saints and to all those that are tuning in and watching us on the live to have an opportunity to learn about each other amen and how uh, important it is that we learn about each other and a couple of scriptures that i want to read is found in acts chapter 17 and verse 16 or pardon me 26 let me say that again acts chapter 17 and verse 26 and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth this scripture is powerful as it teaches us that there is only one human race. It's humanity. And it is the pride of men that divide us uh, by skin color and by uh, ethnicity, etc. But the Bible lets us know that it's one blood, all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth. And so we need to learn about each other because we are all one blood. Amen. And Hebrews 13 and 1 tells us, let brotherly love continue. And so this is teaching us that if anybody should be an example of unity 
and brotherly love, it is the church. The world will always be fighting and the world will always be uh, having issues. But the church, the church of the living God should be an example of unity, of tolerance, amen, of acceptance of one, of an one to another, amen. And we are uh, demonstrating the love of God as he loved people. Jesus Christ, when he walked on earth, he loved people, amen. And so that is what we're doing tonight. We're taking the time, the next uh, two weeks, uh, we're taking the time to learn about each other. And so I'm excited to introduce to you tonight our uh, instructor. Her name is Colleen Jobin. And Colleen is from Whitefish, known as Atikameg First Nation. And she has received a diploma in business administration and office administration, if I can get her visual on the screen. She has also received a bachelor's of education from the University of Alberta, praise the Lord. She currently lives in Athabasca for the last 20 years and has four beautiful children. And she is also a proud grandmother. Colleen has taught Aboriginal studies and the Cree language at her local high school at Edwin Park Composite High School. Colleen enjoys camping, the great outdoors, and being with her church family. Without any further ado, we want to welcome, let us put our hands together for Colleen Jobin as she comes and teaches the history of the indigenous people of Alberta. One more time, put your hands together. God bless you. Praise the Lord, church. And all our fellow people out there. Um, Thank you for uh, taking part in, um, in our session tonight. I know this is new to many of us, <laughs> but like uh, Pastor Schilling was talking about, it is something that needs to be known. Yeah. And so um, as I present this to you tonight, I do it prayerfully and with a lot of uh, respect for my people. Yeah. Um, and in, in the, on that note, <coughs> I would like to um, acknowledge the Treaty Six, <coughs> excuse me, Treaty Six and Land Acknowledgement. Um, what's really cool, um, when I was uh, teaching the Aboriginal Studies program at the high school, was I found out that um, the town of Athabasca, um, Treaty Six is divided by the river down here. Wow. And I thought that was really cool. So once you drive over the bridge, it's actually Treaty 8 territory. Yeah, yeah. so we're like, it's just uh, we're on either way. <laughs> and so in spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge that we are on it. And so there's been a lot of um, talk in the past few years about reconciliation. And um, so on this um, next slide that we have, reconciliation is key. Yeah. Um, the history of indigenous peoples is an impart important part of our story and legacy. Indigenous peoples and communities are vital to our future goals of a prosperous and thriving Alberta. Um, as you can see from this map, it says we are all treaty people. And it's very true because uh, what affects the Aboriginal people, Indigenous people of Canada, of Alberta, it also affects the rest of the non-Indigenous, right? Because we are, we, we work together, we're side by side. And so having a better understanding of Alberta's Indigenous peoples creates an opportunity for Indigenous and non-Indigenous Albertans to move forward. In this presentation, we'll be looking at terminology, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people in Alberta, life on the land, 
worldview, major groups of indigenous people in Alberta itself, the historical context, like what's happened in the past, the treaties, the on-reserve and Métis settlements, off-reserve and what that means, and a quick look at uh, today and the future at the very end. So in order to understand some of the wording that I'll be presenting to you today, I will have to give you the terminology. Aboriginal people, as the first inhabitants of the land we call Canada, are divided into three distinct groups, recognized under the Constitution Act 1982, Indian, Inuit, and Métis. But now the word Indian has been changed to Aboriginal or Indigenous. There are three separate peoples with unique heritages, languages, cultural practices, and spiritual beliefs. Formal definitions of Indian, Métis, and Inuit peoples are complex, and they have been revised from time to time as a result of court challenges and, challenge, and changes to legislation. Indigenous is a term used to encompass a variety of Aboriginal groups. It is most frequently used in an international transnational or global context. This term came into wide usage during the 1970s when Aboriginal groups organized transnational and pushed for greater presence in the United Nations. So they wanted to be included and so that they were trying to get the attention of the United Nations. The term Aboriginal refers to the first inhabitants of Canada and includes First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. This term came into popular usage in Canadian context after 1982, when Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution defined the term as such. The term native is a general term that refers to a person or thing that has originated from a particular place. The term native does not denote a specific Aboriginal ethnicity. In Canada, the term Aboriginal or Indigenous is generally preferred to the word native. So. Next, we have <coughs> the term of uh, First Nations. So we have First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. First Nations refers to individuals and to communities or reserves and their governments or band councils also known as bank councils. The term arose in the 1980s and is politi politically significant because it implies possession of rights arising from historical occupation and use of territory. Though no Canadian legal definition of this term exists, the United Nations considers First Nations to be synonymous with Indigenous peoples. Alberta is home to 48 First Nations. Hmm. And then I'll go to um, Métis first, yeah. Métis, the Métis National Council defines Métis as a person who self-identifies as Métis, is distinct from Aboriginal peoples, is of historic Métis nation ancestry, and who is accepted by the Métis nation. Métis people were for many years refused political recognition by the federal government under Section 91 of the Constitution Act 1867. However, Métis people received recognition as Aboriginal peoples in the Constitution Act of 1982, so years later. And on that topic, Bill C-31 refers to, uh, this bill eliminated discriminatory provisions in the Indian Act including a section that resulted in Indian women losing their status when they married non-status men. So, so the Aboriginal women were losing their status because they were marrying somebody that was non-Indigenous. And so because of that, um, the other thing is that it allowed non-status women to gain Indian status when marrying status Indian men. So that's where the unfairness was. The Aboriginal women, if they married a non-status, they lost their status. 
And when the Indian men married a non-status woman, the non-status woman gained status. So it was like a unfair, right? So because of this, women who had lost their Indian status through marriage could reclaim their status as a result of this bill. So that bill came into play so that now we have Bill C-31 now. Um, and so <laughs> after that, we have the Inuit. The Inuit peoples are those of Northern Canada who live primarily in Nunavut, the Northwest Territories, Labrador, and Northern Quebec. Inuit peoples also live in Greenland, Russia, and Alaska. Yeah. Interesting, isn't it? And so <laughs> next, we have, um, this is actually the stony Nakoda people. That would be by the, uh, the Rocky Mountains. Long before Alberta became a province, Alberta Aboriginal peoples inhabited this land, speaking distinct languages, creating complex government, social, and economic systems, and moving with the ebb and flow of the natural world. Indigenous uh, history is etched into the Alberta landscape going back 11,000 years and 500 generations. From rock carvings at writing on stone in the southern part of the province to a 10,000 year old spear point under the Nathabasca lowlands in the north. Today, Alberta is home to more than 220,000 people descended from First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. Their presence predates both Alberta and Canada, yet not all Albertans are familiar with the rich histories and cultures of Aboriginal peoples or with their present day contributions and aspirations. The unique worldview of Aboriginal people or any people for that matter can be traced back to their creation story. A symbolic narrative how the world began and how people first came to inhabit it Creation stories explain a people's sense of who they are in the context of the world, and in doing, they reveal real priorities as well as values. Next. So the indigenous in Alberta. So there are um, distinct nations all across Canada, but we're concentrating on the ones in Alberta, particularly today. So the Aboriginal people in Alberta are culturally diverse, from the Dene in a subarctic north to the woodland Cree in a boreal forest, and the Blackfoot of the Southern Plains and Métis throughout the province. From time immemorial, first peoples lived close to the land and so it shaped each group's culture, the collection of beliefs, values, and knowledge they share. While the Blackfoot gathered in huge camps on the plains with their lifestyle centered on the great buffalo hunts that provide vast amounts of food, the Dene lived in small groups gathering ed edible plants, game, animals, and fish in extensive forests and lakes. For all their diversity, First Peoples have much in common. Foremost was a reverence for the natural world. The web of relationships linking every human to every other thing, be it plant or animal, rock or river, invisible spirit or thunderstorm, living in harmony with their environment, they made little change in their surroundings for thousands of years. Hmm. So, so the indigenous groups in Alberta, uh, the major, major indigenous groups in Alberta are the Cree, the Blackfoot Confederacy, Dene Saline, Dene Tha, Sutina, Doneza, Nakoda, Anishinaabe, Metis, and Inuit. And we have a small, we have a map um, there. That's the, the map. And on here, you can actually find this resource online. So if you type in we are all treaty people map, you should be able to get it. If you're doing research, you can actually find it online. That's right. And on here it shows um, like the Treaty for Territories, 
6, 7, 8, and 10. So the major um, treaty treaties in Alberta itself is 6, 7, and 8. That's why you see the green, the yellow, and the orange. Yeah. And then on this map also shows uh, the Métis settlements. That, um, they are also scattered all around. Uh, so just for that. Mm. Next, we have, so what is a worldview? Right? What lens do we see our, our world through? What is your worldview? What is my worldview? How, we, how we're raised and uh, the world around us really, uh, it um, plays a big part in how we see things, right? So the overall perspective from which one sees and interprets the world, that is worldview. A collection of beliefs about life and the universe held by an, an individual or a group. So, how do you see the world? So, on here, mm, we have the indigenous worldview and the Western worldview. And we're, um, while we're on this subject, I want to share something uh, like a little personal part of it. Um, when I first moved off the reserve, <laughs> when I was uh, 16, I used to wonder why people would <laughs> cut their lawn, <laughs> right? Because I grew up on the reserve and it wasn't like that. You let everything grow naturally all around you. So uh, for me, it seemed like shoveling snow when it, while it was still raining. That was my perspective, <laughs> that was my world of view. Like, why are people cutting their grass when it's just going to grow again? <laughs> you know, that was how I saw it. And when the trees would, uh, in the fall, when the leaves would fall around, and then you'd have, like, pile, like, le leaves all over. I'd be like, why pile it up? Because it's just going to come again. <laughs> that was how I felt. But so, the indigenous worldview, um, there is two different worldviews. Like, the, w the ex example I just told you, that was my worldview, is it? But now it began to change after a while, right? <laughs> so the indigenous worldview, uh, they have a lot of respect for elders based on their compassion and inner wisdom. And in the Western worldview, there's respect for others. Their respect for others is based on material achievement, right? The higher educated you are, the more you have material wealth, more respect for you, uh, that idea. In the indigenous worldview, humans have responsibility for maintaining a harmonious relationships with the natural world, right? There's a saying that um, if you, uh, um, when you're on a web, when you step on that web, it moves everything else. So what we do to the natural world, where it affects us, right? If we don't take care of our water, right? It, it's gonna eventually, it, it affects us after a while, right? So, and then in the Western worldview, humans exercise dominion over nature to use it for personal and economic gain. But this is not to say that everybody's like that either. Right. A lot of it can be, but at the same time, there now we have people that are more um, more aware of our nature and how much we need the water, you know, and uh, the land around us. Indigenous worldview need for uh, giving back between human and natural worlds. Resources are viewed as gifts. There's a gift of water the gift of the earth that we walk on, the gift of the grass and how beautiful it looks, right? All that. The Western worldview, natural resources are available for human exploitation is one view that some people have. Indigenous worldview, we have nature is honored routinely through daily spiritual practice. And Western worldview, 
Spiritual practices are sporadic and set apart from daily life. Next, we have indigenous worldview. We have wisdom and ethics are derived from direct experience with the natural world. Western worldview. Human reason is more important than a natural world and can produce insights independently. Indigenous worldview. Universe is viewed holistically where everything works together. Western worldview, universe is compartmentalized into separate units. Indigenous worldview, time is circular with natural cycles that sustain all life. So um, one of the uh, most common symbols in the indigenous worldview is the medicine wheel that you might have heard of. So um, our elders, they, they, they see the cycle as from the from the infant stage to the youth stage, the adult stage, and then the elder stage, and then all the seasons are part of that. And uh, also, you have the mental, the emotional, the physical, and the spiritual part of a person. A lot of times, when I was um, uh, teaching about uh, the medicine wheel, and we talk about how. The indigenous people talk, um, look at a person as whole, as a whole. So the one of the best examples I gave them was when uh, a person is feeling really, really sick. It affects the rest of you. It affects you mentally, physically, and emotionally. Right? If you're really, really sick, and in this time of COVID and everything, it's like uh, how more apparent is it? Right? It real. We can really, really see that. So uh, I used to tell the students that, you know, it's understandable if you're really, really sick and you can't do your homework because it's affecting you, right? If your sickness, if you have the flu, it affects, it affects your, my, uh, your mental, your emotional, and even spiritual at times because people will get depressed and stuff about things. And next, uh, Western worldview, we have time is linear chronologically of human progress. So it's like, I was born this day, I was 10 years later, I was in grade, whatever, and then it's just like, like a line, right? It's like from here to there. Indigenous worldview, and finally we have nature will always possess unfathomable mysteries, right? One of the things the elders always say is we will never, never know everything about about the world, about Earth, we won't. It'll take a few lifetimes to know everything. <laughs> that we'll never know. <laughs> nature, uh, Western worldview, nature is uh, decipherable <laughs> to the rational human mind. So, yeah, that's, uh, and that's that for the worldview. Next, we have early life. So here we have a picture of uh, the buffalo, and then we have a couple of indigenous men there uh, posing as wolves or coyotes or something. But back in the day, there was a lot of buffalo that roamed <laughs> around Alberta. Now they're in pens and they're trying to um, reproduce. But um, so we have uh, museums, books, and old stories passed down from time immemorial containing clues about early life among Alberta's first peoples. But a life lived totally on the land is sometimes hard for us to fathom today. We have a glimpse of that when we go fishing or we go hunting, and then there's still trappers out there. But um, to actually be how um, untouched this land was is a little bit more harder to imagine. Yeah. First peoples in this province were hunters and harvesters relying on game like buffalo, caribou, deer, moose, rabbit, and ducks as well as fish. Their living came straight from the land and many of their ceremonies expressed thanks for what they were able to harvest. So they always gave thanks for all that they got. They knew all that. <laughs> and so um, next we have the past shows the way. Here we have a gentleman, 
um, and the two of them are playing with, uh, they're uh, beating the drum. Um, nowhere is the fact that Aboriginal culture is thriving more evident than in the way First Nations, Métis, Inuit youth are reclaiming who they are. As they learn about their historic realities, such as residential schools, and how their families are affected, they counteract the dark repression of the past with vibrant creativity. They're not afraid to put a contemporary spin on old traditions, giving to the world such as such innovations as the powwow dubstep, round dance songs with Facebook references in the lyrics, Bannockburger food trucks in downtown Edmonton, and intricate beadwork on high fashion evening wear. Committed individuals and groups ensure the values and skills of the past continue to sow the way into the future. So, so it's uh, that's a real good thing. Is that um, a lot of indigenous uh, uh, instructors like me are now picking that up and continuing on, right? And so making a comeback, and that's really good to see. It's it's a really it's a beautiful time in life to be a part of that. And I was really honored to work at the high school doing that for our local uh, division. Um, so now we'll look at the uh, different uh, First Nations, Métis Inuit in Alberta. First we have the Cree, and they are the largest population. The Cree, uh, the Cree call themselves the Nihio, the Nihio. And so uh, what that means is real people. Uh, the Cree people call themselves Nihiawag, the two-part word that breaks down to mean the sacred number four, Nio, and the original healers, Ainu. Traditionalists refer to themselves as four directions people. The Cree are one of the largest First Nations in Canada and have one of the largest geographic distributions extending from Alberta to Quebec. The Plains Cree and the Woodland Cree are the two groups in Alberta. Historically, they were much the same, sharing a language and customs, but they live differently because of their environments. So you have the Woodland Cree up in a northern area and the Plains Cree. For instance, Woodland Cree built their houses out of birch bark, while Plains Cree used buffalo hide to build teepees. Entrepreneurial at heart, the Cree played a role in the fur trade as voyagers, hunters, and trappers. Because many Cree women married European fur traders, Métis culture often shares elements of Cree culture. The population on First Nations, Today, there are 30 federally recognized Cree First Nations in Alberta. The reserves are located in a Treaty 6 and Treaty 8 areas. The population of Cree nations varies. The smaller reserves have a few hundred people, while the larger nations have more than 7,000 members. Social and economic activities. Cree nations are socially and economically diverse. Communities located close to resources like oil sands and timber have enthusiastically developed companies to extract or harvest them or provide services to existing industry. For instance, Mikasu Cree First Nation in Fort Chip has built a highly successful group of companies that services the oil sands industry. The Sorridge Group of Companies was founded by the Sorridge Cree First Nation of Slave Lake, Alberta. So these are just two examples. There's lots more. Like if you Google it, there's lots. There's lots, and that's really good to see. And then we have some place names in Alberta that come from the Cree language. Fort Chipwan, named for the Cree word for the Chipwan people, which means pointed skins. It referred to how the Chippewans prepared beaver pelts. And then I added uh, Saskatchewan. It means fast flowing river in Cree. 
So, and the true saying of that would be surkichewan. Surkichewan means fast flowing river. And then I was telling my son the other day um, when we were passing a, a location just n south of here, is a place called Nistal. Yeah. And I was telling him that refers to a brother in law, Nistal. So, <laughs> you see that place. And then there's another one, um, me, they call it Minook around here, but the actual saying in Cree would be Mia Nook. Mia Nook means a good place. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. And so next we have the next nation, the second largest nation is the Blackfoot people. And, uh, the word for um, the Blackfoot, they call themselves the real people, is called uh, Nitsapi. The Kainai, the Pikani, and the Siksika nations in Alberta, and the Blackfoot nation in Montana. A division of the Pikani formed the Blackfoot Confederacy. Historically, they were a single group that lived in large clan-based groups on the plains and in the foothills. Today, they are closely allied. The culture of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Confederacy is traditionally linked to the buffalo, both economically, economically sorry, and spiritually. Historically, they used pecans, pecans or buffalo jumps near foothill streams, like the one that can be seen at Heads Maston Buffalo Jump Center near Fort McLeod. Having lived in Alberta all these years, I've always wanted to go, and I still have to make it there. <laughs> we have su we have such uh, beautiful places in Alberta. Yeah, I even told my sister like my Banff. <laughs> I told her she laughed at me, and she said, "What do you mean my Banff? I hardly ever see it." <laughs> she just laughed at me. <laughs> Population next. Located in the southern part of the province, the three Blackfoot Confederacy nations are all relatively large in terms of population. Pekani First Nation has more than 3,500 members. Siksika Nation has more than 6,000 members. And the Kainai First Nation has more than 11,000 members, making it one of the largest First Nations in Canada. The Blackfoot Nation in northwestern Montana is also large with more than 16,500 enrolled members. Yeah. The language family, the Blackfoot language is part of the Algonquin language family. Social and economic activities, ranching and farming have long been important economic activities for the Blackfoot and still are today. These First Nations have also operated other businesses with varying degrees of success, including an operation fabricating jeans. The Blood Tribe Agricultural Project, a community-owned project on the Kainai Reserve, is successful. Established in 1991, it provides water to about 10,000 hectares of farmland and produces hay for export to other countries including the US, Japan, Korea, and the Middle East. And the project provides employment and opportunities for education, training, and mentorship for the Kainai First Nation members. As on many reserves, band-owned facilities provide members with necessary services as well as opportunities to engage in traditional practices. For instance, the Siksika Nation has a sportsplex, a college, a daycare center, and health and wellness center, as well as an elder's lodge, a medicine lodge, a men's lodge, and a place for holding powwows. So, and there was a little thing here about uh, the Blackfoot and the Cree. The Blackfoot and the Cree were often at war years ago. And although adoptions were common among Plains people, heads turned when the Grand Siksika Chief Crowfoot adopted a young Cree warrior named Poundmaker, who would later become a famous leader in his own right. 
So if you ever hear those names, that's part of the history. <laughs> and next we have the Dene Saline. In Alberta, four groups identify as Dene. Dene Saline, Dene Tha, Sutina, and Dene Za. These groups share similar spiritual beliefs and social organization as well as similar language from the Athapaskan language family. But historically, they had differing relationships to the land and are unique from one another as a result. And then uh, one interesting part I found out was uh, the Dene and the Navajo in the Southwest US share the same language group. I was like, really, like, wow. I was like, I was like that too. And I, because um, we have a few family members that moved down to the Navajo Cree, the, the Navajo Nation down in uh, New Mexico. And so when a friend of mine, uh, who is Dene herself, was down there with us, she could understand some of the words. And I was like, wow, you guys <laughs> understand each other. <laughs> like, you understand some words. <laughs> and then later I was to find out uh, that we also have uh, Cree speakers down in um, uh, Montana area. So it's like you know, these little things that, that you find out along the way. So the Dene Saline, the history is the contemporary name for the cultural group formally identified as the Chippewan. Their traditional territory was the boreal forest and f waters covering a large area in the Northwest Territories, Nunavut and Northeastern Alberta. So as you can see from that map, it sort of covers a little bit of Alberta too. <coughs> Excuse me. Living and migrating in family groups, they hunted caribou, wood buffalo, and waterfowl, and caught fish. The Denisolane began trading with their Europeans when the Hudson's Bay Company, company opened in Fort Churchill. Population. The Denisolane reside close to the Saskatchewan border. Coal Lake First Nation Reserve land is located in Treaty 6 area, 300 kilometers northeast of Edmonton. The registered population is 2,135, with about half living on reserve. And social and economic activities. Economic activities have changed over time. For example, families on the Coal Lake Reserve practiced agriculture in the form of cereal crops and cattle production for many years. They had horses and eventually purchased a steam engine and caterpillar to help with farming. Today, after a period of high unemployment, they practice some agriculture and the nation owns a number of other businesses. So, and then um, the Athabasca Chippewan First Nations is also part of that, that keep traditional activities. So, and next we have the Denetha. Uh, people common to the territory or common peoples. That's what their name stands for. History. The contemporary name for the cultural group, also known as the Slavey, Denetha means simple people. Their homeland includes the Caribou Mountains and Hay River regions of Alberta, and that people traditionally went far into the Northwest Territories for hunting. They typically stayed in woodland areas even when caribou could be found in abundance on the barrens, and they were skilled at hunting, trapping, and fishing. Population. The Denitha live in northwestern Alberta on three reserves. There's the Cheta, or uh, also known as Assumption, Meander River, and Bushy River. Uh, and that's, that's like north of high level a high level area, which is north, northwest of here. Approximately 1,800 members live on these uh, Denetha reserves, while about 600 live off the reserve. Social and economic activities. The Denetha First Nation, like all other First Nations, takes care of the social needs of nation members. 
and economic activities include businesses in small engine repair, taxi service, home building, and electrical services. So they have like gas stations, food stores, laundromats, bottle depot, coffee shop, and such. And did you know tea dances are still held in the three Dene Thaw communities of Bushy River, Assumption, and Leander River, though not as often as they used to be. And next we have Sutina. The history of this First Nations is the contemporary name of the cultural group once known as the Sarsi, a Blackfoot word. They were closely allied with the Blackfoot Confederacy. They are related to the Daneza in northern Alberta, but the two groups have lived separately for a long time. They may have split when the Korean and Nakoda moved into the province. As a result, the languages of the Sutina and the Doneza are now quite different. Originally, the Sutina lived in the north, but they later adopted a Blackfoot Plains lifestyle revolving around the buffalo. Today, the Sutina and the Treaty 7 First Nations have a close relationship. The population. The um, Sutina has 2,038 registered members as of December 2012 most of whom live on the reser reserve adjacent to a Calgary's southwest border. Social and economic activities. Sutina First Nations has taken advantage of the reserve's urban location to build its economy. The reserve has usual infrastructure and also owns a golf course and a highly successful casino. And that would be the Sutina, we have the Doneza is next. Donze. Um, it's the contemporary name of the beaver people. <coughs> and excuse me, the members of the Doneza called themselves Chate or beaver people. They traditionally lived among the Peace River in northern Alberta. Expert hunters and trappers, they lived in small family groups with group size changing as food supplies changed. These small groups would get together in larger groups for ceremonies and other social events. They reside in Northwest Alberta near the Peace River area. And next we have the Nakoda. The Nakoda have also been referred to as the Stony, Assiniboine or Nakoda and Paul First Nation in Alberta refers to the name Stony. Once part of the Sioux who lived between the Mississippi River and Lake Superior, the L Lakota separated in the early 17th century and moved north. They moved west during the fur trade and later split into two branches, one which continued the woodlands lifestyle. Members of the Paul and Alexis Nakota Sioux nations descend from these people. The other group adopted the Plains culture of hunting buffalo and members of Stony Nakota First Nations near Morley are their descendants. Population. Alexis Nakota Sioux Nation and Paul First Nation are in a Treaty 6 area in the western part of the province. Stony Nakota First Nation is located in Treaty 7 west of Calgary. As of December 2012, Alexis Nakota Sioux Nation had 17, 1,796 members. Paul First Nation had 1,989 members. And the Stony Nakota had a population of 5,189 members. The language family is a uh, Soan language family. So, and the social, economic, and activities are the Nakoda engage in a variety of social and economic activities for example a golf course and a gas station convenience store uh, also contribute to the economy of the Paul First Nations so that's part of what they have and next we have uh, the Anishinaabe the Anishinaabe 
or Salto, are a branch of the Ojibwe nations. They came to Alberta from the eastern woodlands in a Sault Ste. Marie region in the late 1700s. Originally, they settled in Manitoba, eventually move, moving further west, where their lifestyle changed to one of buffalo hunting. The population, the Anishinaabe population in Alberta is small. Ochi's First Nation, located in a Treaty 6 area northwest of Rocky Mountain House, is primarily made up of Anishinaabe and Cree members, and around 1,000 people live on the reserve. The language family is the Algonquin language family. About 70% of the people living on the reserve speak Salto, and most can understand Cree and English. Children learn their traditional language in daycare, in a Head Start program, and in school. And the chief and council conduct business in Salto. Cool. There's social and economic activities. The Ochis First Nation has many community resources that benefit members, including a preschool to grade 12 school, adult upgrading, daycare, pool hall, public works, a store, health center, a dental clinic, and a fire hall. The nation also provides cultural programs, including sun dances and round dances. To help its members and the community succeed, Ochi's First Nations offers training opportunities in heavy equipment, management, childhood, early childhood development, security, and more. And so they have also uh, businesses and established number of ventures. And so that's the Anishinaabe. And next we have the Métis. So the Métis, this proud Aboriginal group has a foot in both the Aboriginal and European worlds. And distinct, our distinct identity recognized under the Constitution of Canada. Skilled voyagers, buffalo hunters, traders, and interpreters, the adaptable Métis helped shape Canada, especially the prairie provinces as the West was developed. Some Métis have French ancestry, while others are descended from Scottish or English Hudson's Bay Company employees. As the only province in Canada to grant the Métis a land base, Alberta shares a unique relationship with these proud Aboriginal peoples. The Métis, with their colorful history and culture, strong sense of entrepreneurship and willingness to actively participate in politics add to the mosaic of the province. The history. A mixture of two very different peoples, the first Métis were born in Eastern Canada in as early as the 1600s. The children of European fishermen and their Aboriginal wives, their understanding of both societies ha helped bridge cultural gaps, placing them as integral players in the fur trade. They spoke European and First Nations languages and had the knowledge to take European ideas and make them work in a wilderness landscape. Creating, for example, the Red River Cart, which allowed fur traders to move large amounts of freight product across the country. So as you can see from that picture, you see a little like wagon type in the center there. That's, that's the Red River Cart. And right above it actually is the uh, Métis flag. It looks like an eight, but it's an infinity symbol. Um, in 1869, about 8,000 Métis people lived in the Red River Valley in what is now Manitoba, but was then Rupert's Land, a territory, a territory owned by the Hudson's Bay Company. Many were involved in the fur trade and agriculture, and the buffalo hunt was very important to them. When Canada took over the area and Europeans began settling the region, the Métis lost the land they had called their own for many years. After they moved west and again found their borders encroached, Métis leader Louis Riel helped petition the government to secure land. But Ottawa dragged its feet. Riel's followers and a government clashed, resulting in a famous and final battle at Batage. And so, as time passed, Métis people here in Alberta established communities where they engaged in their traditional activities of farming and hunting buffalo. St. Albert, 
Lac Saint Anne and Lac La Biche are three such settlements. In these new communities, they laid out farms just as they did in the Red River Valley, in narrow strips that ended at the river. And so, uh, so they established a Métis land base, and um, they had to work with the governments. And then, so for the Métis people, there are actually it says here around 5,000 people live in the settlements of Buffalo Lake, East Prairie, Elizabeth, Fishing Lake, Gift Lake, Kikino, Paddle Prairie, and Peavine. This is a small portion of the more than 96,000 Métis people living in Alberta. So those are the settlements in Alberta. So moving forward, Today, the Métis Settlements General Council continues to represent the interests of the settlements. And then we also have the Métis Nation of Alberta. And that's the symbol that we have up there. Uh, the Métis Nation of Alberta Association continues to be an important political organization. Has, it has grown a small, from a small organization to one with members of approximately 35,000. This provincial organization is an active participant in government policy and decision making. And their head office is in Edmonton, by the way. And the languages, so many Métis people speak Cree. The Métis Nation of act actively promote the preservation of the Michif language, a combination of Cree nouns and French verbs developed by the Métis. And so we have the, the Métis flag, and they also have a, a Métis sass. Uh, common, commonly, um, the ones in Alberta that I see a lot are the ones in red, and there's a weaving in there of different colors, and they all have a, a representation. <coughs> so they have also, um, the Métis people has its, its own historical context and what's happened along the way over the years. And then we have the Inuit people. Alberta has a small Inuit population that compromises Inuit who have left their northern homes to live south of latitude 60. Inuit peoples are distinct from other Aboriginal peoples and understanding their heritage is important in developing a better understanding of all Alberta's Aboriginal peoples. The history. Inuit peoples made the Arctic their home managing the challenges of the climate, long periods of darkness, blizzards, snow and ice, little vegetation in innovative ways. For example, they protected themselves with insulated waterproof clothing made of animal skins and furs and built homes out of snow and ice or from earth, driftwood, moss, bone, skins and rock. Family is important. Inuit peoples lived in small family groups that joined in camps that varied in size with the seasons. Most camps had 30 to 50 people, the perfect amount to monitor the many breathing holes in the ice that might yield a nutritious seal in the winter. Population communities. Inuit communities are found in none of it, the Northwest Territories, Northern Quebec and Labrador with only about 10% of the population living outside of the Arctic. Most of those who leave the Arctic choose to move to urban centers like Edmonton. In 2011, there were 1,985 Inuit people living in Alberta. The language. Inuits speak Inuktut. The language is expected to endure and most, as most people who speak it live in traditional territories that haven't attracted settlers and haven't been as affected by outside influences. Social and economic development. Historically, Inuit people lived off the land. In the mid-1950s, mining projects and other changes resulted in a federal government trying to promote earning wages by providing opportunities for education and training and incentives for economic development, including cooperatives and credit unions. Many Inuit people living in Alberta today came here for education and economic opportunities. They earned their living in a broad range of industries and jobs. Um, 
governance. Uh, traditionally, most Inuit groups were led by the one who thinks. People who chose to follow, follow the Isom tag, if they thought he was a good hunter, decision maker, and role model, and they were free to ignore his advice. <laughs> and Inuit people did not sign treaties with the Crown and were originally not included in the Indian Act. That was one of the interesting things I found out when I was teaching the program in the Aboriginal Studies. They were they didn't sign treaties. Yeah. They were added to the Indian to the Act in nineteen twenty four and the federal government took responsibility for administrating programs and services for the Inuit people. In the 1930s, declining numbers of game animals resulted in many communities facing starvation. The government instituted a re relocation program moving Inuit people to permanent communities where they could access government services. But relocation brought its own hardships. For example, some communities were moved to areas where they could no longer hunt and tramp in the winter because of the area's ice patterns. The program was discontinued in the late 1970s. The Inuit people gained the right to vote in 1950. One year later, they were excluded from the provisions of the Indian Act. Self-determination is important to the Inuit, just as it is for other Aboriginal peoples. When the territory of Nunavut was created in 1999, the Inuit, gained, the Inuit people gained the right to be major participants in how the territory is governed. Today, the territorial government is a public government in which anyone can hold office, but because the majority of the population is Inuit, it gives Inuit people more control. So, and they have a uh, consensus style of government. So, it's a unique form of government in Canada. Hmm. Next. And so next we have the, uh, the highlights um, of what has happened in the past years. Uh, as we all know, it has a lot has happened. <laughs> there was lots of uh, changes. So some of these highlights. Uh, the Royal Proclamation was in 1763. 1867, the British North American Act. And all these can be found online, but because of time, we can't go through everything. But one of the ones I highlighted was uh, the Indian Act, uh, created in 1876. Nearly the Indian Act, nearly 10 years later in 1876, the Gradual Civilization Act and the Gradual Enfranchisement Act became part of the Indian Act. Through the Department of Indian Affairs and its Indian agents, the Indian Act gave the government sweeping powers with regards to First Nations, identity, political structures, governance, cultural practices, and education. It gave them a right to like say and do anything they wanted, right? These powers restricted indigenous freedoms and allowed officials to determine indigenous rights and benefits based on good moral character. So the better person you were, the more rights you had. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the Indian Act attempted to generalize vast and varied populations of people and assimilate them into non-indigenous society. So that was part of that. 1879, the Devon Report. Um, this has to do with the uh, residential schools, but we'll get more into that uh, next week. Uh, 1960, finally gave the First Nations a right to vote. Uh, 1969, the white paper. The government came up with a white paper and that was also an act of assimilation. It was to do away with the Indian Act and for the indigenous, peop indigenous people to be part of uh, Canadian society without any special rights. And so in 1969, there was the removal of Indian agents. 
So these Indian agents had the power given by the government to have this pass system. So if you wanted to leave the reserve, you had to talk to the Indian agent and he could determine whether you could leave or not. So <laughs> but finally in 1969, they removed them from power. The uh, 1970 Citizens Plus, the red paper, so the red paper was a comeback from the indi indigenous community to say no, no to the white paper, no to being assimilated into the Canadian society, but we still want that special status because we're a special nation, right? And so uh, 1972, Indian control of Indian education. 1982, the Constitution Act. 1985, Bill C-31, that was in 1985, that's when we talked about where the indigenous women lost their status if they married non-status. So in 1985, they're given that right now. 1996, the Royal Commissions on Aboriginal Peoples. So these are just some of it, like there's so much more, like, but our time is limited, so we can go next. And then we have um, the First Nations and treaties. And for that, um, we have the question of what are treaties, right? Some people have no idea what that means. Treaties are sacred foundational documents for First Nations peoples. We often hear First Nations talk about honoring treaty rights and their strong ties to the Crown. In order to gain a greater understanding of the past and present lives of First Nations peoples, it is important to gain an understanding of the relationship of First Nations peoples to treaties and treaty rights. In the Canadian West and North, between 1871 and 1921, the Crown entered into treaties with various First Nations that enabled the Canadian government to actively pursue agriculture, settlement, and resource development. Because they are numbered 1 to 11, the treaties are often referred to as the numbered treaties. They cover Northern Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, as well as portions of the Yukon, Northwest Territories, and British Columbia. Under these treaties, the First Nations who occupied these territories gave up large areas of land to the Crown. In exchange, the treaties provided for such things as reserve lands and other benefits like farm equipment and animals, annual payments, ammunition, clothing, and certain rights to hunt and fish. The Crown also dealt with matters such as schools on reserves, teachers, or educational help to the First Nations that signed treaties. Not all treaties are exactly the same, right? Because it's different nations, different customs. For example, treaty number six included a clause about a medicine chest. So. And there are also different interpretations of the signing of the treaties, of what the treaties meant. For most First Nations, treaties were viewed as establishing a peaceful coexistence where land would be shared, not given away. So that was the First Nations understanding, right? Because when you think about um, time then, it's like they, they uh, had areas where they would go hunting and fishing and, and that, and it was like, to be shared, like you didn't go fence this little area and say, this is my fishing spot, right? It was all shared. And so when the idea of the treaties came in, of course you would have the, uh, the language barriers as well, right? Like for me to speak Cree to you right now, like a lot of you would understand me. <laughs> you would just say yes to me if I asked you for your house in Cree. <laughs> So that's just an example. <laughs> uh, I'll give you a glass of water for your house. That's what I would say in Korean. You would say, yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> so, and so in Alberta, we have uh, Treaty 6, Treaty 7, and Treaty 8, uh, mainly. Treaty 6, signed in Carleton and Fort Pitt in 1976, it covers central Alberta and Saskatchewan, and it includes 17 First Nations. Treaty 7, signed at the Blackfoot Crossing of Bow River and Fort McLeod in 1877. It covers Southern Alberta and it includes seven First Nations. Treaty 8, signed at Lesser Slave Lake and Fort Chip in 19 or 1899. It covers parts of Northern Alberta, British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and the Northwest Territories. And it includes 25 First Nations. That's a big one. And then we have on reserve and settlements. So a uh, common saying um, is uh, there's, a, there's on reserve and then there's off reserve. So on reserve means those that are living on the reserve. And then there's off reserve people like me like who used to live on the reserve but moved away for school, for training, for employment, now you're off reserve, yeah. So in this way, um, the best way to understand what life is like on a First Nations reserve or Métis settlement is to visit one. I wanted to include that because it's so true, right? Um, I remember a friend of mine saying, uh, when I mentioned Athabasca, there's like, what is an Athabasca? And I was like <laughs> trying to explain that. And it's just like a beautiful little farming town and all that, right? But, you know, just telling it, it's not the same as experiencing it as well, right? You go to any reserve and you'll see and you meet people, beautiful people. And so, uh, the people living there are mostly Aboriginal. Some non-Aboriginal people may have married into the community or they're there for um, like teaching positions or doing work there as well, right? And families are involved in everything from farming, ranching and teaching school to home craft businesses, trucking firms and fashion design. You'll find a range of amenities like schools, churches, stores, health centers, radio stations, water treatment plants, sports facilities and community centers, depending on which community you'll visit. Some First Nations reserves are within or near urban centers, but most are rural, like out. Sutina First Nation is right on Calgary's doorstep and band members may live on the reserve but spend their working hours in a downtown skyscraper. Conversely, Fox Lake, a member of the Little Red River First Nation, is an isolated community in northeastern Alberta where everyone, even small children, still speaks Cree. Nice. Moose and buffalo are important sources of food and back-breaking process of hide tanning the old way is still carried out. Nice. All of Alberta's Métis settlements are located in rural areas, some distance from large cities. Like life in one community differs from life in any other due to location, culture, economic development, politics, so social issues, services, size, and host of other factors. Some individuals stay in a community while others choose to leave temporarily or permanently. Reasons for leaving include access to opportunities, including education and jobs, and a desire for an urban lifestyle. The big city lights. Living in the First Nations, Métis, or Nan status community allows people to be close to family and friends and to live surrounded by their own culture. There are opportunities for hunting, fishing, and trapping, and for choosing a more traditional way of life and living according to traditional values. Ceremonies and traditional activities are an important part of life in Aboriginal communities. Yeah. Next. And then we have living off reserve. So uh, as I said before, uh, many move away uh, due to education, employment, and training. And um, 
It is a common dilemma of fear, or Aboriginal in living on a reserve or settlement, you want to be close to family and your culture, but education, employment, and training call you to the city. In 2011, not only in the cities, but other bigger like towns, right? I would be uh, Whitefish, um, which is where I'm from. And so we have Slave Lake and then we have High Prairie, which are closest one, closest towns. So people will move there for the same opportunities. In 2011, 43% of Alberta's Aboriginal populations lived in Edmonton and Calgary. First Nations and Inuit peoples abound in Alberta's urban centers working in a broad range of careers. To maintain a cultural um, connection and share traditional values with others of like mind, many belong to organizations like friendship centers. Mm -hmm they were created for this purpose. So we have um, our Athabasca Friendship Center here, right? And so when people are looking for resources to connect with uh, um, uh, like different, um, if they need help with um, connections uh, and cultural activities or stuff like that, that they want to find out more about in town, uh, a lot of the First Nations will go to the Friendship Center. Um, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people abound in Alberta centers, and so they also go to uh, cultural societies and elder centers. So in Edmonton, you have more of these organizations, but because we're a small town, we only have, um, I think, well we also have a Métis organization in town. Um, moving to the city can be a challenge, and as statistics so, the unemployment rate for First Nations living in urban um, centers across Canada is five to six times higher than that for non-Aboriginal people in the same area. The experience of losing community and the support of social ties can make the experience stressful and unrewarding. On more isolated reserves or settlements, education and training may be unattainable. But on that note also, we now have online. So it's that it has opened up lots of doors, right? It's, it's improving. And Aboriginal people face discrimination, differing values and expe expectations. Poverty is widespread among urban Aboriginal people and statistically, a large percentage of Aboriginal people off reserve are below the poverty line compared for to non-Aboriginal people. Aboriginal people living in cities face racism and discrimination, which can negatively affect them in many ways, including make it difficult to get a job and diminishing self-esteem and confidence. On top of this, they can feel alienated living among people who do not share their culture and values. And so that's part of uh, what um, indigenous people living off reserve face. They, f they face a lot. And so uh, the friendship centers began in the 1950s, often people's homes to, be to connect Aboriginal people new to the city for resources and services. In 1970, the Alberta Native Friendship Centers Association became the first provincial territorial association to be incorporated. Today, there are 20 friendship centers in Alberta. That is really good. Yeah, so as um, uh, speaking uh, and knowing and having experienced the life of uh, being off reserve, I know there's a, there's a lot of resources now than there used to be, and that's a real good thing because now they have uh, more organizations to help you. And I've seen that over the years. And so as we wind down, we have our next one today and our future. So as you can see, um, the preceding passage means that Decisions should be guided by consideration of the welfare and well-being of the seventh generation to come. So the Aboriginal people always refer to the seven generations 
like because we have to be um, mindful of the next generation coming behind us and all the ones behind, right? So um, the elders talk about being uh, like, you know, taking care of our water, taking care of our land, right? What are we leaving our children? What are we leaving our grandchildren? So, um, so 140 years down the road, Albertans, whether Aboriginal or not, want their province to remain a good place for their children's children. When Aboriginal people march for clean water, for example, most of the mainstream society realizes how important it is to protect this valuable resource and want the same for generations to come. Aboriginal leaders say short-term economic gain that does not sustain our natural systems and the environment is folly. And game-changing partnerships with Aboriginal people in ventures like cleaner energy are the new reality. Many Aboriginal leaders agree that First Nations have the right to self-determination and that self-governance is essential. They also agree that different peoples will need different models of self-governance but there are varying ideas about how and when to pursue self-governance. Some First Nations have many resources and would like the Indian Act abolished. Others with lower resources would like to see the Act revised so they can have a continuing relationship with the federal government. Some groups want Canada's Aboriginal people recognized as one of Canada's founding nations. Urban Aboriginal people also have their own views and expectations. On the road ahead, First Nations, Métis, Inuit peoples will be challenged as they work to agree on and achieve goals related to self-determination, creating self-sustaining communities and balancing mainstream, mainstream and cultural values. And First Nations, Métis, and Inuit leadership will continue to focus on creating new economic opportunities for their people. So that's one of their goals. The road ahead is one that all Albertans share. Mm -hmm. Through increased understanding of one another, non-Aboriginal and Aboriginal people will help to ensure that path leads us all to a successful future. And next. And there's a couple of uh, misconceptions as uh, this slide shows. So one of the things that uh, people will always say or talk about is uh, Aboriginal people or Indigenous people don't pay taxes. That's what people think, but it's not true. Here's the fact. Because of the Indian Act and treaties, which only affects First Nations, First Nations people living and working on reserve don't have to pay personal or property tax, but Métis people and Inuit people pay taxes, and First Nations people who live and work off the reserve pay taxes. They are, we are required to pay taxes in most circumstances. Additionally, Aboriginal communities are typically small and don't have stores other than perhaps a gas station and a convenience store or other small places like that. Community members travel to nearby towns and to larger urban centers to buy all the things they need, so Slave Lake, High Prairie, and Edmonton. Taxes must be paid on most of those purchases, even by First Nation members, and those purchases contribute to the local economies of these towns and cities. And then finally, Aboriginal people get free education and free health care. Not necessarily. Some do and some don't. Aboriginal people are entitled to the same things everyone else is entitled to, including old age pensions, employment, insurance, child tax benefit, health care, and K-12 education. First Nations people also receive post-secondary education assistance and uninsured health care benefits. The federal government gives First Nations money for post-secondary education within limits, and the nation decides who to fund and how much to provide to them. So when I went to school, 
uh, I used to apply every year to get into uh, to get funding for post secondary. And I call it sort of like a lottery system because maybe one year you'll get it. <laughs> so <laughs> that's how I, I saw it as. And eventually I, w I, I was able to go to school. <laughs> so uh, they have certain criteria that must be met when applying for this funding. However, there may be instances where there is more demand than funds and communities have to limit applications, right? So if they only have uh, funding for 10 st students to go to school to post-secondary, that's all they can accept out of 200 applications. Yeah. The uh, federal government also provides First Nations Inuit peoples with a limited range of um, drugs, dental care, vision care, medical supplies and equipment, short-term crisis intervention, mental health, counseling and medical transportation. So that's all written up. And at the very last there we have the resources for those that would like to know more. And I finally I just want to say thank you for listening tonight. I know we went through a lot, but that's just like a in a nutshell. <laughs> And so I hope you're able to uh, learn something tonight, and I want to thank you for listening. Um, and um, having um, been, uh, lived, uh, having lived on the reserve and then off reserve, um, uh, and uh, going with the experiences and everything that comes with it, living um, in different places throughout Alberta, I eventually ended up in Athabasca, and um, I am so thankful to be part of uh, Shallow Tabernacle because this is my home, and I, I love my church family, and it's like um, where God has brought me from. I could tell you stories, I could tell you a testimony, and I will in time. But God has brought me a long, long way. And uh, for me to stand up here um, to tell you about my beloved people is an honor. Because we have such beautiful, beautiful elders, and uh, we're losing them day by day. And they have so many stories we still haven't heard. And when I was teaching the Aboriginal Studies program, I really realized that firsthand that we need to get these stories down. So um, I just wanna leave a little um, a scripture with you tonight before I leave. And in uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and this is the one, one of the ones that have always stayed with me from the time uh, when I started living for God. And he, it says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Praise God, and that's what God has done for me. He's done so much for me. I could not tell it all. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you. Let's put our hands together for our sister Jobin. What a wonderful <laughs> lesson that we have learned and heard. I was tremendously blessed and informed and educated tonight. Thank you, sister Jobin, for sharing all of this wonderful information with us. Truly, I have learned a lot. I wanted, I, I asked her before I came to back to the podium I asked her if it would be all right if we could ask her questions, because I think this is such a safe environment for people to be able to ask questions. So I'm going to put it out there to all of those who are watching us live. If you have any questions, I think this would be a great opportunity for you to ask um, our instructor, Sister Colleen Jobin, 
And of course, this could be uh, on the lesson, or it could be a question that you have regarding the indigenous peoples of Alberta. So I'll give you just a few moments if you have a question, and then we'll get ourselves situated here with a microphone so that uh, Sister Jobin can respond uh, appropriately. So let's just put it onto full screen and give everybody an opportunity uh, to uh, get the questions um, typed out and then we'll look through them here and uh, we'll do our best to answer them. All right, so just give us a few moments here. Let's get a question from the floor. All right, so we have a question here on our text and it says, culturally, are there any elders who would have the full language and customs passed down from their parents? Is that, the, is that correct? Is that the, does that make sense? I'll get you to read that. So culturally, are there any elders who would have the full language and customs passed down from their parents? Um, yes, a lot of um, a lot of times, uh, uh, the parents would uh, teach um, their children hands-on. So that they would know, um, so that they could carry on the traditions, because if you don't do that, then the next generation would not be able to pass it on to the next generation. Right. So, a lot of that was uh, so that it would continue on, and that uh, that uh, actually um, that should actually be our goal. Right. Whether, whether it's a uh, um, a spiritual goal or a cultural goal, but if you want someone to continue on, then you should teach so that they can also teach others. Yeah. Very good. All right, so are there any other questions from the floor? So the question is asked, what programs are in place to pass down the customs and cultures to the next generation? Is that correct? Yes. Today's programs, um, one of the best things that I've seen happening lately <coughs> for today's uh, uh, generation is uh, the elders are finally, um, they're, they're starting to teach the younger generation so they have cultural camps okay and uh, they will take the youth out onto the land and have hands-on activities because when you're doing something uh, as opposed being as opposed to being told what to do but showing you makes a difference it, it, it lasts longer and they'll, they'll know for themselves and so that's one of the best things that they have done and also um, on that note, I'm so thankful that we have uh, many First Nations writers and teachers, right, that, that teach others and then they're writing it down. Because years ago they used to, um, there was a time when uh, it was sort of like taboo to talk about, um, like say medicinal plants and that. Right. Because it was uh, like uh, passed down from gen generation to generation, but it wasn't written because it was an oral language 
parents miss me. Nothing was written down. So for a long time, there was resistance to having that written down. But now, now you can actually find books for uh, medicinal um, knowledge from the plants that are around me. Okay. Uh, so uh, a question that I have, um, what, what, what are powwows? What, what do they do exactly? Oh like why are they dancing? The powwows, um, the powwows um, are like a, the indigenous people used to get together years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they would have like a, these tea dances, um, brown dance and all that. And it was, it was uh, to celebrate uh, like say a successful hunt. Oh, okay. So they would get together, and then um, what came into play is uh, the um, the Aboriginal people uh, had these dances from years ago. Actually, some dances um, have um, because of uh, uh, the government clamping down on the the ceremonies and the dances and all that mm -hmm. from uh, legislative. They they wanted them shut down. We lost a lot of dances and we lost a lot of customs because of that. Right. So only a few came back, but um, the powwows actually uh, they have uh, they have the men the men uh, dance and the women dance and, and uh, the elders dance as well, but it's for different purposes. So a lot of times they they have these dances like say if you choose uh, the jingle dress dancer. Right. There's a reason and a purpose for every dance that they do. So it's maybe to honor someone who had passed away, or maybe they're dancing for somebody that's sick, and it's for their healing. Okay. So yeah, every every dance they do represents something. Right. Yeah. What about like what they're wearing? Is 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 it like just creativity and colors, or does everything have a meaning behind it? Yes, there is a meaning behind okay. the colors even. So it's all personal. Yeah. Ah, to the individual or the family? or uh, I think probably both. Okay. Yeah, sometimes I think it's individual. But yeah, it, it represents something. It means something to them. Right. Yeah. Excellent. Very good. Are there any other questions from the floor? So the question is asked, um, how does one that is not an Aboriginal visit reserves? Are there yeah. certain events, because you mentioned in your lesson, to visit for yourself and to see, yeah. how would that look for non-Aboriginal people? What can we visit or what event? that um, um, the like say the documents that talk about uh, teachers going into uh, a First Nations reserve to teach one of the things that um, they should do and is uh, for best practices is to get to know the people and so because they'll be on the reserve um, it to take part in the any events that they have right so um, for example the powwow um, like anyone can go, and you can go observe and watch what people are doing, the ceremonies, and you know we get to meet people and talk to people and meet. Right. You know, and then uh, also, um, if there's other events, like say uh, Orange Shirt Day is coming up. Right. Right on the thirtieth. Right. So um, a lot of the uh, the reserves and all that, they'll many of them will have a uh, Orange Shirt Day walks and different. Being involved in the events and getting to know the people. Really. Yeah. One more question. So the question off the floor is, 
for an individual such as yourself that is off reserve, mm -hmm. how do you adjust to Right. So how does one off reserve adjust to the westernized world but it still stay true to who you are as an indigenous person? Um, for me personally, it's uh, uh, being staying connected with family mm. and friends back home. I make trips back home to go visit. Uh, I love talking to my auntie because she just speaks Cree, a lot of Cree to me. So it's like it all comes back to ah, me, right? Yes. Like they say when you after you've been taught how to ride a bicycle, right. you never forget that right. idea, right? So a lot of words, um, when I was teaching the Cree language program, um, there was a lot of words that um, that came back to me because um, the language and uh, the culture are interconnected, mm -hmm. right? So um, you can't, it's sort of hard to uh, separate so everything, when I hear my auntie talking in Cree, it just brings me back uh, to how we grew up and everything that I know, right? So, and so living out here, I make those connections by going to visit or them visiting me. Right. And so, and also, because now we have internet, I, I will um, like, um, watch videos and read books and stuff like that, always being aware of the changes that are happening over time as well. So um, being able to teach this uh, um, presentation tonight has really helped me because I have the background of having lived on the reserve and then living off reserve. So I come from both worlds and it's easy for me to uh, go live on the reserve or live off reserve I'm sort of in between two worlds. Right, right. Yeah. Wow, wow. It's really cool. So I'm going to conclude with one final question. Yep. Um, how does one who is not an Aboriginal make it very um, clear to an Aboriginal person that they are their friend, they are for them, that they understand at least a little bit? Because we live in a world where there's a lot of divide, right? There's a lot of walls. Yeah. Yeah. And when you see people in the grocery store, when you are walking along in your everyday life, you know, there's people that have walls. Mm -hmm. What is something that an individual can do um, that can bring down those walls quite quickly? Uh, from experience, perhaps. Yeah, um, by uh, saying hello and greeting them every time you see them in town, mm -hmm. right? Because you get to know a face if you, they greet you. Right. Uh, and, um, you know, let's take a little, little talk or something if you have time. Um, because when, like, when I first moved to Athabasca, um, I didn't really know anybody in town. It was just my sister that I knew, mm -hmm. really, right? And then, uh, uh, the church as well was um, that I knew, but then again, um, for the locals in town, I didn't really know anybody. So with that, I would just um, I was like really shy back then. So for me to go into uh, an organization in town or or somewhere, I felt uh, more timid right. back then. But there was people that would say hi to you and make you big welcoming. So that made all the difference. Right. Right? And so over the years, you grow a bit of your relationship with the people in town. And um, so have being warm and welcoming yeah. to whoever you meet. Right? Right. My dad, I'll, uh, when I think about my dad, he always, he, uh, his um, point of view was always to always give everybody a chance and every have to respect everybody right because you know we, we're all created equal in god's eyes amen yeah. so excellent mm -hmm. so i'm hearing from you kindness yeah be kind, be kind. and you can yeah. see it in your face and smile yes yeah. Yeah. very smile good for sure. wow that's a universal <laughs> language yeah be yes, kind and smile yeah. 
excellent. Let's put our hands together one more time for our instructor tonight. What a blessing. Yeah, thank you. Up. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Job. And we're getting some great comments here. How to uh, visit the reserve. Thanksgiving. Come on down, Sister Lamouche says. <laughs> uh, La Boom Tea and Bannock. <laughs> and say, Tan say, we love being greeted like that, meaning, hi, how are you? Okay. So, meaning, when you see an indigenous person say tanse, yeah. is that, did I say it right? Yeah, it means, hello. means hello. All right, very, very good. And, um, and Sister O'Donnell just asked, how do you pronounce that? So once again, it's pronounced tanse, tanse. Very good. All right, wasn't this wonderful? Yeah. Yeah. Amen, this makes us a better church, yeah. a stronger community. Amen. We're working together. We love one another, and let's continue. And uh, Sister Lillian says, smile and say tanse. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Excellent. <laughs> okay, we're going to conclude tonight. Thank you for being a part of this wonderful uh, Indigenous Awareness course. We're going to, of course, continue on with our lesson next week. And I know Sister Jobin's got wonderful things in store for us. So I'm going to encourage you to take the week to, uh, if you have any questions, we're going to do a Q&A again. And what better place in an environment like this, amen, where it's genuine and it's safe and, you're, and you genuinely want to learn and to, and to care. Batteries burned out. That's a good sign of a good lesson. <laughs> All right. As we conclude, uh, just a reminder: our announcements for uh, this coming week, or rather, this the continuation of this week. Uh, to all of the ladies, tomorrow, Sister Schilling will be doing her live broadcast with you at seven o'clock. Everybody, say seven o'clock. All right, so this is for all the ladies. This will be live on Facebook and on YouTube, and it's called Living Room Chats, and you definitely don't want to miss this. Our closing scripture is found in 3 John chapter 1 and 2, and it says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. Thank you for being a part of tonight's lesson. Leave us a comment below how it has blessed you. We're looking forward to our second lesson. God bless you tonight in Jesus' name. Have a wonderful night. God bless. Bye-bye.